As per usual, before we begin any event, including this one here, in Edge, we do a prayer, okay? And we do have a school prayer that's been ongoing at our schools in Ghana. And it's a eight line prayer that we do in that. And I'm going to do it because I've been doing it for so long in that. It's right in here in my head. And I'm going to try and get some copies or the next class will distribute that. And it's just an eight line prayer. It was developed by an individual or collectively some individuals from our our school district and that, and they use it at all our schools. Kainai has four schools, two elementaries, a middle school, and a high school, okay? And that prayer every morning, it's done over the intercom, or if it's not through the intercom, it's done in class. And right from the, right from the, when they're at the Head Start program, they start doing this prayer. So everybody, I am gonna do the prayer, and then right after that, we'll, we shall begin. Now, we're just going to wait for. And I've heard this too. Uh, um, <clears throat> some of our, our ceremonialists on our, our local unit, they say when somebody is doing a prayer, um, they ask everybody to sit. Like you stand up, right? And that's just probably some of our teachings. And I, and I, I yeah, I, I grew up with around these elders that were speaking. Black but only, and then they're always telling us, and I just stand up, you gotta get to watch some movies, kind of. My old big man, you know, I sit down and listen. So, get off that book, go ahead. That's the piece of crap you got. Yeah, you know, it's uh, at the end of the prayer, and that, you know, because the, you know, the prayer itself, and that speech has energy, right? It has energy in that. So in the prayers, when, when somebody's doing a prayer, there's a lot of positive energy that's being spoken out there, asking for, you know, um, <clears throat> things and that. So it's all positive. And then at the end of the prayer, what you do is that you take that positive energy that this person has given out, and then you just go, hey, you internalize it into your, yourself, and I just say to your heart, but into yourself, hey, hey. Because that the prayers and that what they ask for and that was well, some of the most powerful prayers and that are you know when you go to these ceremonies and you listen to them the prayers they're not just eight lines and that it's a very long long prayer and all the things that they you know they want to see and they you know they bless everybody the families and so forth and that and then you know they go hey and one of the things they ask for right now is that we're going to see spring. Spring is here, you know, and then we're all saying, oh, hey, you know, and you wake up on March the 20th or the 19th and say, hey, you know, spring is here. So, okay, so we're going to start. I'll do the prayer, and hopefully we're going to get that uh, the copies of the prayer to you all. Y'all? Yeah. Okay, we don't have to do this, okay? You don't have to kneel. May you just bow your heads or just, you know, just sit quietly and close your eyes and then we'll say the prayer. Now, at the end, okay, you go, hey, okay, all right. I, this is bad to be you. He kicks him at him, then, this bumble can, and of course, it's a good. Him, I do, can, hey, stomach, you can, so copy. Ekinapi, mukamu tapi, ayo kima tu kena, nena nix, nixes sena nix, nak sena nix, nech tapi mena nix, ayo kima tu kena, kamu tan sami tapi sini, everybody. Hey, it's just a short little prayer. And um, my son Joseph here was attending the, uh, the, uh, the after school program, and we did that prayer and that, that it, at one of our Christmas dinners. And uh, he did the prayer for everybody, all in Blackfoot. You know, we were quite proud that if he kind of repetitively just say it and say it, and after all, you'll just say, oh, you know, it's just it's like the Lord's Prayer, you'll just know it. Okay. So Blackfoot, we are going to learn Blackfoot today. 
Who in here is Canadian? Who in here speaks Canadian? <laughs> huh? Yeah, we speak English, but the, you know, the language of what they would call the people who discovered, depending on which school you went to and that, or the people who colonized this area, right? Indigenous people are that English is a foreign language, right? It came from afar in that, right? English has its culture that's not indigenous here, right? The Blackfoot Senate, we are a people here that already, right? We were here. Canada was born, Alberta was born in Blackfoot country, okay? The language of the people is of the land. And they, they didn't come from abroad. It was right here, right? It was born right here in that. When you were hunting the, the T-Rexes and that, yeah? you know, it was just, you go first. So it is from here. You know, as long as they start digging up, archaeologists start digging up, and they're finding that, you know, further you go down and that, they're starting, they, they, they're still discovering the tools of the Blackfoots, right? The word Blackfoot is a name given to us, not by us, okay? It wasn't a name that was given to us by, okay, we're the Blackfoots. Lewis and Clark, everybody knows Lewis and Clark, right? Their expedition. As they were coming west, they were expanding, you know, the, the United States Kingdom and so forth, of that the Empire of the United States. As they were traveling west of that, their guides who were probably from the Dakota areas and that, they said, okay, what's the next group we're going to be seeing, right? In 1806, Lewis and Clark came up across eight Blackfoot Indians. And on their journals and that, the guides told them, you're going to be running into the Blackfoots. You know, the Blackfoots, right? So thus, the Blackfoot was born through the literatures, the writings, you know, the uh, journals of Lewis and Clark gave us the Blackfoots, right? And ever since then, we've been called the Blackfoots. So that, who's, whose area is this? Oh, it's the Blackfoots. And we're going to go into what we would call ourselves like the Blackfoot speakers or that, right? <clears throat> but before we go into that, does anybody remember what we did last time? What did we do? We did the alphabet, right? Okay. So, Blackfoot today, as we speak, is spoken by just a few, no, I'm not going to say a few, there's many of us in that, but just a quick statistic here. I can never say that word statistic. statistic. There are 50,000, 50,000 registered. Blackfoot Indians, if you, can, if you say, collectively between the Blackfeet and the three tribes here in Alberta. 50, that's about 50,000, right? They say, oh, that's a, that's a large number. But there's only like 1,500 speakers left out of the 50,000. 1,500 of us left. Statistically, that's what they did. They did a demographic study. I'm not too sure when, 2020, around about there. And they, Found out that Blackfoot language isn't spoken at home anymore. Uh, it seems to be primarily English, right? A language that's from the from abroad, right? So the first language of our children now is not going to be Blackfoot anymore. It's all going to be English in that. So what we've done, the Blackfoot language people, of course, they started going to school. So they started going to the university and they started studying the sociologies and the archaeologies and the anthropologies and so forth and that. And they say, you know, the culture of the people is in the language, right? The culture of the Nitsitapi, the Blackfoot tonight, comes from the language, right? It's not, a, not all that dancing and so forth. It's just that power. It's the language, right? In order for you to understand the people of this area, that we need to use to view how we view the world and what comes out from our mouths, okay? How we started um, changing the language in that was when, of course, the, the, uh, with the, with the, the colonization and that, right? And we started learning English and that and so forth. And the speakers started getting small. <laughs> but the academic world, like I said, they knew that, you know, this was going to come to a day that 
the language itself is going to be taught in this mode, right? I taught at St. Louis School in Standoff for over 20 years, strictly Blackfoot, all Blackfoot from the four year olds all the way to grade three, four, and five. <clears throat> And that's the mode of how we're going to be teaching a language now, is in a classroom setting, right? Where the teacher is going to have a chalk or you know whatever and that. They'll have boards and so forth. You know, you're going to be Mr. Dress Up and puppet shows and so forth. That's to be, that's going to be the way how we're going to teach our language through classroom settings and that. So they went to school, and one of the people, huh, you know, I just so dear to my heart, this individual, but Lena Russell is one of the most, uh, the, the, the person that really started up black within the classrooms and that. And Lena, it's not just me, it must be in her 90s. Yeah, well, Lena went to school, we went to university, and she, you know, she thought, you know, we need to start teaching uh, black within the class. So her, along with some other individuals, and collectively in that, they developed a Blackfoot language dictionary. And you can buy that here, right, Kristen? Yeah. For a low price of no. <laughs> three installments. <laughs> three installments. <laughs> so they developed a writing system, right? Blackfoot is not a writing culture. It's an oral traditional culture that the knowledge that we have through the years and so forth that it's all through verbal, right? Oral, right? If you need to know certain things about certain items, you know, the, you know the, the, the environment that we live in, we listen to our elders, right? They're the ones that pass on that knowledge and that, all early in that, right? Today, we just pull out our phones and that, and, oh, okay, okay, there you go. But we really needed to listen. As black and language speakers and that, the language, is strong because we listen. We listen to the, you know, istanupal. We listen to the language in that, right? Stories, right? Not these stories. You know, the, those kind of stories or war stories or any kind of stories and not, but they're out there. Have you ever asked a question about certain things in that to an elder? You won't just answer your question. It'll give you a big, long story. Within that story, and that is your answer. You just have to figure it out, right? So you have to kind of sit there for maybe for about 10, 15 minutes. You're looking for the answer, and at the end of the story, and you walk out. No, no, it's a really, that was a really good story. When the bloods would say, oh, that was a wicked story. But within that story, and that is your answer. And that's how Blackfoot is passed along, and that through dialogue, through storytelling, and so forth and that. But now we've moved into a classroom. We've now moved into a classroom where the teacher, all right, this is how you say this word. This is how you say that word. There's all pictures and so forth and that, right? Lots of nouns, right? Lots of actions. And Blackfoot is very descriptive in the sense that what we see, we describe it, right? Uh, just an example. You are sitting on a chair, right? Something that's new. You know, we never had chairs. So in, so we, in essence, we looked at it, and we have to give it a name, because it's going to be part of our world now, right? Supatsu. 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 Means you're sitting up off the ground. That's supo. Right? And you think about, you know, the days of the buffalo, the teepees, and that. Tokune Supi. Everybody sat on the ground. So suddenly, you've got this to sit on now, right? And you're looking for, okay, where am I going to sit? Oh, my suit boxes. Oh. So everything he, that was, came into our world, the Blackfoot world and that, we had to visualize it, give it a definition, and give it a name. Right? When you think about the primitive societies or the old societies of old and that, you think about, oh, you know, the Egyptians and the Mayans and their pyramids and that. And you know, they're still trying to figure out who built the pyramids, right? And they're still trying to figure out the, you know, the, the pyramids of the Mayans. How did they build those things, right? They're ancient civilizations and that, but how did they build those things with where you're still using stones? And, right here in southern Alberta, you go to a place called Majorville, right? 
And it's one of the oldest, if not the oldest, um, <clears throat> rock formation anywhere. And they figured it's over 10,000 years old, if not, right? So am I, right? And who built those? We did, right? The ancestors built that. that. What did they do? Oh, well, they got these spaceships and they came down and they carried those. No. They actually carried those rocks. And if you ever visit that area, now some of the rocks are huge, right? They're about this big round and that. And they carried them from about three, four miles from the riverbed up to that area of that, right? And they got this huge rock formation that's called Major Rock. Mumbai. That's what we call them. Mumbai is rock formation. And it's huge, right? So it's no secret that the people that were here were the Blackfoot tonight. There was no mystery. You start digging into the ground, a head smashing, buffalo jumps, spearheads, war, you know, and then uh, all kinds of clubs and so forth and that. I should have brought my, every time we go walking and that, we look for rocks and that. I found a perfectly round rock, just like this. In the middle is a little bit of a divot. That would have been a good rock for Baksinikimon. Okay, and there was another rock that I found. It was formed like a club. And oh, the smoke! So I'm gonna go make some bucks in Ikima. Oh, bucks in Ikima, eh? Or sat to sat Yeah, you know. So you know, it's those type of things that are evident that we were here. You know, and the oldest DNA, the oldest DNA dates back to what did they say? Thousands of years. The oldest DNA was right there from Heartbeat, Montana. A man. So, you know, we've been here long before anybody else, you know, the, or the newcomers. And then they say, welcome to the new world. We are still the new world, right? But our world had to adapt to the new ideologies and so the systems, the system of governments, right? The system is of school, you know, the, the, the police system, you know, the legal systems and that. We're all born here. We had to adapt to those new systems, okay? So in any society, any group of people that live in a group, you would have to have some governance, right? You would have to have some kind of leadership on that. You would have to have some sort of, you know, uh, laws, so to speak, and that so that the group can live very cohesive, right? Well, we had a hereditary system of government, our chiefs, right? You say chiefs, we say nina, right? I'm going to go back, and I'm just trying to think of the, in our administration building, when you come up the stairs, there's a wall that has all the chiefs dating back to the 1700s. Bow back fat, okay? Bow back fat, stomach to suck. Stomach to suck was one of the first chiefs that were there. And I think he was kind of instrumental uh, because he was the one that brought the horse. It was that rain, but with Bo Blackfat, the horse came. But Bo Blackfat was able to expand probably the land base that we own now, right? Yellowstone, Regina, all the way up to the South Saskatchewan River and to the Rockies. Huge, right? After Bo Blackfat, then you have seen from afar, been upward. And there's a ballpark, I do believe, that's just down here, named after him, right? The reason why they chose that, because apparently, being up with him was buried in those trees there after he had smallpox, okay? Then after, okay, and okay, then after that, I'm gonna go, being up with him, and then I think meat gates to break from, okay? And that's when, of course, the first, not big ones started coming into our areas and that, right? So that transition and that was starting to shift away from what we were as people to now a new adaptation, right? The new ideologies that come in. After Red Crow, I'm gonna say, I'm trying to look at that picture. Red Crow, Crawford, right? Ah, big. So that's four. Now we're going back to the 1800s. We're already, I mean, 1700s. And we're already into the 1800s and that, right? And how many presidents were there already in the United States? And 
1867 was Confederation, of course. Red Crow was already the hereditary chief after these three and that, right? So, you know, so the shift of change, and now we started to have people coming into our area. Red Crow, right? And after Red Crow, of course, we signed the treaties, you know, with the, with the Napi ones, with the Ninawaki. We'll explain that. And then something after Red Crow, then he gave um, shop outside. Now, these names are just Blackfoot names. There's no English names yet than that, right? So after shop outside, then James shop outside, then the, 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 the Western culture, we started adapting a lot more now, right? Now we had Christian names, right? And I understand Jim. And those early Christian names were very easy. Jim, there's George, you know, and there's May, there's Bob, you know, just really one syllable names in that. The names of those individuals now were their last names. They were given Christian names now, and that's how they came about. So they had Indian agents that would come in, and they would establish offices and that, and we all have to go register. So my name, well, actually my um, last name is Delaney and that, so that's kind of, it doesn't count. But on my... My, my my maternal side of my family are Weasel Moccasin. Now he was a man. That was his name, Ape right? Weasel Moccasin. He went to go register, and then it's like, hey, what's your name? He's an interpreter. Oh, I'm stuff. Weasel Moccasin. Man. Okay, now your name is going to be, and they give him an English name, Dan, right? And that was his name. And they come out, they say, it's like, what did they call you? Oh, my name is Dane. Now, you know, French to do weasel moccasin. And that's how names came about here. They were Blackfoot names. I went to go register, and then they would give them a name, like a Christian name, right? Like right. Bruce Tate. Yeah, you know, that's another. You never got a Christian name? Yeah, yeah. And there's some people, too, like, I could go back to my uh, my paternal. A guy out in cinema. Uh, and that was my, and then his new pita man stuck. Sheep woman. Yeah. But anyway, so that's how. So, you know, those new ideas were now coming into our, the world that was once ours, you know, the world that was nature, the world that was rivers, valleys, plants, right? Animals, um, indigenous animals in the sense that animals that were not here yet, right? We had to start adapting to the new animals that we brought in. And then we'll, we'll do animal study here. So now we are now in a system of a new government, right? We have to adhere to the government that was way down in Ottawa, right? The, uh, the central part of what we would call the Canadian government and so forth and that, right? Then they established what they would call provinces and that, right? My grandmother, Gumaki, was born in 1898. Alberta was born in 1907. So he, you know, he was, he predated Alberta, right? So Alberta was born, and my grandmother lived to be about 95, 96, and so forth, and Akumaki, right? Yeah. So she lived at a time when Alberta was born. She lived at a time when there was a First World War, right? There was a Spanish flu epidemic that happened, right? Amongst us and that, we had what we call smallpox. But she was born after that. But she was born, like, she grew up in, like, two world wars, right? And there was another epidemic that kind of hit us there for a while, too. TB. You know, the TB really hit us hard, too, and that. So my grandmother's stories and I, we used to listen to her and that. Some of the, you know, she grew up in the sense of the change that was now happening. Right? In 1877 or so forth and that, we signed the Treaty 7 and that, right? So just about 30 years after that, then she was born. So as a child, she knew the stories of many individuals that traveled to Blackfoot Crossing. Heard all those stories and so forth and that. And she used to tell us, because her mother was from Sixaga, and they would go on a horse and buggy, and they would travel, what you would call a trail. I think what highway is that through Vulcan? I'm not too sure, but there was a trail through there. And they would stop over at a place called Nabhda. Nabhda is what you call Carbon Day. 
that area is, it's called Naumachta because there's no trees. It's, it's just a river, Naumachta, right? It's just a river. Or as you go to these rivers and that, there's lots of trees and that. Stop there. And then it would go a little bit further, probably right to Sikhsukha, right? You just don't do it. It's a two day trip. So, you know, it wasn't that long ago. My grandmother, my goodness. And that. So, when you think about the history of where we are here and that, you know, it's a short little while and that, boy, oh boy, it's just grown. We got cell phones and that, so forth and that. Oh, yeah, no kidding. If I travel to Six Gulf today from here, it'll take me an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Galician, Six Gulf, whatever they call it from there. Yeah. But, you know, so we have such a short history here, right? When you think about 1907, well, see, my grandmother and I, well, she would, she's older than Alberta, my grandmother, my maternal my grandmother. And my dad was born in 1937, and he just passed away about three years ago. Just at the beginning of the pandemic, the day after we shut her down, we buried my dad. He was 85. And then he had some stories in that of horseback. He was an old cowboy. He grew up with Blanche's brothers, uh, uncles, the Bruce Tates, right? So, you know, those stories and that, that's how I learned Blackfoot, listening to the elders, listening to my dad, because the first language they had was Blackfoot. Make a great seat for you. Yeah. And I went to residential school for two years. Yes, in 1967 to 1970, I went to St. Paul's School, residential school. I'll only say that. But yeah, I was one of the first people after that in 1966. Or 60, okay, I'm just trying to think. In 1958, here, right here, we had a permit system. Uh, Native people weren't allowed out their boundaries unless it was signed by an Indian agent. This is what time you're going to be here. This is what time you have to go back. So in 1958, we abolished that law. We were allowed to come out. So like, the schools were now open. And in 1966, in grade one, I had no knowledge of English. I had, you know, we didn't have TV. And then I came to school, Lakeview School, 1966, and that I was five, no, 64. I'm trying to think of my age. My <laughs> half is <away. laughs> But uh, we were one of the first people that came into this community at schools and that. Did you think we got welcome? Oh, no. I remember our principal, they looked at us, a bunch of Indian kids coming off the school bus. Uh, big finger, thing. it was like this. We follow him. You know what does he do? We didn't go outside, and then we put in a little room. We sat in a little room until the bell rang. And then we got brought to our classrooms. Recess, we'd all have to go back in there again. Lunchtime, same thing. That first year, right? So, you know, the schools, the community was not ready for the community to come out in that. You know, it's such a segregation type of environment. Now, you know, exclusive, and then, oh, you know, what are you going to do? Over the summertime, Mr. Larson, that was his name, passed away. The next year in that grade two, our principal was Mrs. Grove. Mrs. Grove was a Japanese Canadian. And boy, did we ever go outside to play recess, and we played soccer, boy, I tell you, it was just so much different with her principalship and that, right? Because you know the Japanese and you know, the history of theirs in Canada and it's not as good as, you know. So we were oh, we were just free to go out there and play other ball, soccer, what else we go out there? And all kinds of stuff in that. And as you know, like, we had an adaptation. I didn't know what recess was. I didn't know what lunch was. I didn't know everything. I can't even say that. It's called math, right? And then it was in those days in that boy Italian, it was very tough to listen to the teacher. Me and my friends, we spoke Blackfoot all the time in that. So we reached this time, we started talking black. There's a big skinwatch. Oh, and it just sucks in that sneak into that. Yeah, so that was my upbringing. And here I am. 
teach in Blackfoot. Yeah, yeah. So, anyways, I attended a college, I attended university, and I have stories. That's how we, the dialogue in that, right? The dialogue. So, how does a government system like that exist over the years without having a constitution, something that's written, right? How do they collectively behave cohesively, right? Why is there, it's the, it's, it's the language of the people that maintains the cohesiveness of the group, right? So our leadership on that, they had a lot of dialogue. It wasn't a dictatorship type of thing at all. And if you ever see old pictures of camps, right? If you gaze out into, you know, into a camp and that, and you're gonna try to figure out, okay, which one of those camps, one of those teepees is there, cheap, right? So the mentality of the Western is that the kingdom, you know, this is, seems to be a very new kingdom, right? Because in Europe, and that they had monarchy systems and that, right? They had palaces and oh, this must be their king and this must be their czar, right? Big palaces. Their view here was much different. So they, as they gaze out into the, you know, the cabinets and that, they're not going to know where the chief lives and that, right? There's obviously a leader here in that. So how did they operate? Well, just through dialogue. Nina, okay? The Nina, of course, is the man. But also, too, the Nina is what we would call, you would call chief, right? Is the leader. And then collectively amongst the Ninas, they probably had one person that really spoke highly of them. Okay, this is going to be our representative when we signed the treaties and that. But then, you know, they collectively in that, they had other minor chiefs in that, right? Amongst them. And also, too, the role of the Atiks was very important within the structures of those camps. We couldn't move forward. We couldn't move unless we had the yes by our women. Our women were held very high, right? Very matriarch, almost in the sense that, okay, so you get to see the well, all of us were done to study the Atiks, and they were going to check, okay, and the and the Atiks, and the and that. And then the women would say, oh, they would think for the camp, not for you know an individual in that. You know that to move forward in that, it's like like the mothers in that. Is it good for the camp? Yeah, it's good. Okay, let's do it. He dies the pistachi, or then they move. Matriarch, as opposed to patriarch, right? So we had to adapt to that system of patriarch. Because we were kind of equal in a sense with our with, with our societies and that. So we slowly moved to that the patriarch system. The man was the head of the home and so forth and that, right? Like the Pope is in, you know, and then your kings and your queens and so forth and that. So we had to adapt to those type of thinkings. But they must have had fun with it too, right? You know, within the language, you know, they must have really talked about, you know, what kind of system is it that they you don't even get to see who were you know, the, the queen or the king and that so forth. So the Blackfoots, we really had to adapt to the new, uh, the new advances, right? The new homes. Along with that, we had to start developing a new system of how we talk, right? So on your first one, let's first look at who are the speakers of the language. There's no other language anywhere in the world except right here right here in Southern Alberta and in Montana. There's no other group. English is, of course, Canadian. We all speak it. The Americans, they all speak English. Who else? New Zealand, right? The Aussies, they call them. And another one is, of course, the continent of Australia, right? All English, lots and lots. So they expanded their, you know, their, their um, empire, so forth to that. But right here, Right here in the good old southern Alberta, there's no other people that speak the language, but right here, us, the Blackfoots, or the Nitsita, if you want to call it. So, in your papers, let's look at the first four groups of Blackfoot speaking people. You call them the Blackfoot Confederacy. Okay? On top of your people is what we would call the Gaina, not Kainai. Gaina. Remember last uh, the last time they said the K is a th. 
So when you see the K, don't think of it as a kite, right? It's a dot, okay? And we'll, we'll explain this, but anytime you're gonna see the, the K in that, think of the G sound, okay? Gain. And of course, it is a culture of people. It's a descriptive of a people that are called the many chief people, the Gaina. That's who we are, the Gaina, the many chief people in that. And it was another group within our confederacy that called us that, right? So we are the, we are the Gaina, right? Right here in Southern Alberta, one of the biggest reserves in all of Canada. Big strip of land there that we call them Gaina, the many chief people. But it is word that we call the bloods. And somebody wrote a paper on that. They said it's, it's a misinterpretation. It's a apesitapi, which means the weasel people, right? Apani uh, is your, your blood, right? So there's kind of a misinterpretation of that. But for the most part, Gaina, right? It becomes now a people, but now it is a place, right? It's become a, a, a place, right? So I get to do Gaina. Oh, it's a gain for right? So it now it's, it has become a place. And you were born into the, the tribe, right? You are from Gaina and you marry, and then you have your child. They are a child of Gaina now, right? Gaina, the many chief people. Now, the, I've heard stories of how they came into our area and that, and were asking, what the guy gets in that wall? Who is your leader? Who is your chief? And different people are raising their hands. Oh, my God, I'm like, sit down. Well, Larry's the chief. Well, no, I'm the chief. No, he's the chief for that. So they couldn't. And that's how we became Gaina, right? So this was a time of the buffalo. This was a time when they were still probably using the dog. And that, it's an old name, right? Second of them is what do we call the Bigani. The Bigani are called the scabby road people. In other words, in the sense that Apikani is that at a time when they were still using buffalo pelts, you know, the women probably didn't scrape. Maybe they were in a hurry. They wanted to get to Walmart. You know, they gotta... So as they were scraping the hides and that, they probably left pieces of meat on their garments and that, right? And of course, when they dry, it'll scab. So either the Gaina or the Sixth God came across them and noticed something characteristic about them. So they call it the Bikani people, the scabby road people. <clears throat> and where are they? West of Fort McLeod, east of Pincher Creek, small little band of Bikani. Now, I want to skip and go to the last one, um, Scabby Bikani. There were actually one people at one time, but what happened, of course, to Florida and Ontario, you know, they split the United States and Canada, and they split them up. You know, the, the, the remaining Bigani people are in Montana now. But there were one people at one time, right? There was just a huge amount of people. Um, Scabby Bigani is the southern Scabby Road people. But they are the same people, right? They just got separated by the United States and Canada, right? And we go over there. I can speak Blackfoot and they'll totally understand me in that. But the thing is, you can't find anybody who speaks Blackfoot down there. Okay? I think I only know one person and he passed not too long ago, Earl Old Person. Old, old, Earl Old. No, no, I'm still. Old person, right? It's three simple, yeah. Oh, just about five years ago, six years ago. But I think he was the last of the speakers over there. Like the fluent speakers, eh? So if, if I go down there in that day, it's, it's, it's going to be really hard to find anybody who speaks Blackfoot. Uh, like here, Gaina, anybody that's born in the 50s, like myself, we're still speakers in that. But after that, you know, the, the, the generation after us, that's when they started losing the language. But yeah, it's, there's still quite a few of us, like in here, blind feet, see, but anybody else? Speak black. Yeah, see, they're still amongst us. And as a man, a speaker of the language and that, there's a women, we really have to respect our way of conducting ourselves in Blackfoot because of the respect we have with our 
our women, our grandmothers. You know, we really have to have a boundaries. You want to put tanish banan, you know, so those, you know, the old adage, today students are not gods. I want the students, you know, it's those, those old customs and beliefs and that. So that has got to be gun. Another one they were saying about them is the, the, the ripped up garment, right? If you have, you ever go to the Levi's store and you got these pants that are already ripped up already? Well, those pants are what we call skate B and it's a right? I mean, they're all ripped up. So the first part of that B is to have ripped up garments. That. So it's, it's either too apikani or ripped up, right? So, you know, they must have, it, it has to do with their garments and that. Either they had scabs on them or they must have, you know, they must have had lots of rips on them and that. They just couldn't patch them up enough and that way they got to go to Walmart quick. So, you know, so there's two ways to say, you know, the ripped up garment people, you know, they're all kind of raggedy in a sense, or the scabular people. No, the, the, um, the bucks to be gunny, like the, the ones in the north. My grandfather used to call them skinny pikani. Uh, skinny pikani means the pockets. They had pockets in their garments and that. Somehow they had sacks or something attached to the garments and that skinny, eh? The skinny tzimats, you know, right? So, you know, they must have, you know, you know, like you're going for a hike, put yours in there and then and away you go. You know, like, like a backpack. <laughs> yeah, skinny pikani. And I heard that. I'm scrappy pikani. Why do they call them that? Well, that's where they come from. That's how we identify ourselves as a confederacy in that, right? Anybody from pikani? Ah, Bikani. Okay. And we understand that he's from the culture of the Bikani, you know, those people over there. But we still understand each other. So, number three, Siksaga. The Siksaga people, of course, are north of here, of course, east of Calgary. They're in between the towns of Galician and Clooney, right? And there's another little town called Arrowwood. They're right there. Siksaga literally means the Blackfoots. Right, the Blackfoots and that. And the story has it, you know, either the Gaina or the, the Pikani came into their area and they noticed all their moccasins were all black, either muddy or probably walked through charred grass. Because did you know the Blackfoots in the springtime, like right about now or someone starts, they would deliberately burn the grass. They would burn the grass until it just ran right out into the next river. Because the buffalo will come, fresh grass, right? Oh my goodness, the buffalo will come, got a smorgasbord full of good grass and that, right? So that's why they had it burnt, you know, they would burn the grass and that, because we don't have to go very far. Buffalo is right there, right? They'll come to us. But in the meantime, you got to walk across that charred grass and that, and you're walking around in that grass and that, and you can't find a brown stew store. So I'm just going to keep wearing my moccasins. And, they're going to come black, right? So at the time when their moccasins were black, probably the gang or Scabbat Pikani or whatever, and they seen, oh, that's a good Siksika. Thus became the Siksika. That's how they became the Blackfoots. Not the feet, but their moccasins were so full of grass, I mean, like mud, and they were just so black, right? Call them the Siksika. So when you say bloods or gaina, go like that. Sign like just across your eye, just like that. Be tiny. Yeah, just like this. And it's six of God, just point to your feet like that. Yeah. Smack it up to the uh Dana. Be tiny. Six of God. Yeah. And that's who we are. Right? So those are the four language speaking people, fifty thousand of us right here in southern Alberta. You guys ever hear of the Navajo speakers? Navajo Kotong? We had some. We had some. I heard a story. Did it's to know all um uh and uh, Harold Cornell? Yeah, and his brother is John Tao. They both enlisted in World War One. They were both in the same infantry, the same company, and they went to uh I'm not too sure if they were at the D-Day or is it after D-Day in that, but they were active combat 
And then their infantry were walking and they got separated somehow. They got separated and the Germans were all in between the that. And they had a rendezvous point in that we're supposed to meet another company, right? John Powell, it's each of the group. The commanders in each of the found out, hey, you know, these two people speak a language nobody else speaks of that, right? So they got on the radio, they went back and forth in Blackfoot, and they were able to successfully, without anybody dying, and they were able to meet at the rendezvous by speaking Blackfoot to one another. Because nobody else speaks Blackfoot, right? There's nobody else in the world that can speak black, but like the Navajos, right? The Navajos, when they started talking in their code and that, you know, the Japanese, what is that? I never heard that language before. So the people in that, the only language that's still, you know, it's unique. It's an ancient language, right? It's a language that's at the time when the Romans were occupying the land and that, there was black with people here, right? And at the time when the Egyptians were building their pyramids and that, we were still hunting buffalo off our buffalo. We had a language, right? It's a very, very language that's very descriptive in a sense. And I just described the people that speak the language, right? And they'll say, well, there's an Indian. Oh, no, that's a kid. That's a, that's a Picani. And there's another one. Oh, that's a six of one, right? And there's another one. Well, no, that's a, that's Kena, right? We're very descriptive in a sense of the people who we are. Right now, now let's go into a new people that came into this area. And you call them. Oh, can you guys see this? Yeah, not the one. <clears throat> Last, what do we call the new people that came into this area? Not people. And you'll say the white man, you'll say, no, no, no. The first not people that came into this area and that, you know, they you talk about Anthony Henday, right? When they first came into the with the Hudson Bay Company way up north there. But even before that, in the 1700s, there was an individual named Gatlin. I think his name is George Gatlin or somebody like that. He came into this area and he painted bow backpack. And that very painting is sits in the Smithsonian in Washington. The very painting that 1700. We're trying to get that back, by the way. So those individuals, right, were the first not people that came in here. Fiddler was another one too. They came into an area with a huge cap, about a thousand, a thousand caps, so forth. But then the not people started coming, right? Who came first? Whiskey traders, just so yeah, the Americans, right? And now the Americans and that, of course, you know, they're they were selling their whiskeys, were trading and that. So we've seen these people for the first time, probably. So the speakers, that's how they dance to tell Muxi Kuya. So they watched how they behave, how they conduct themselves, right? And how they interact with each other and with their women. We have in our stories of an individual named Nafi, okay? Now, Nafi was, of course, a trickster, if you want to say that, but he was also an individual that we would use as a means to bring the group back to balance, right? If he behaved outside the norms of a society, right, he would use Nafi's stories to bring back balance in there, right? Nafi was a person that was crazy. He didn't share, right? He, he behaved in a sense that he would really correct the whole social fabric of a cat, right? And then how he treated women, right? How he was very selfish. And he didn't follow rules, social rules and that. Because in order for a cat to, you know, to, to conduct themselves, you would have to have social norms. Within the language of the people and that, you start to develop values, right? And these values, Collectively, we follow them. Kimma Pipitsa, right? And Nafutsi, those type of values in that. And it brings balance in that. Well, Nafi behaved outside those things in that, right? Then so we observed the, you know, these whiskey traders, you know, the Americans, and we call them Nafi. Because they behaved very abnormal. They were, they were behaving themselves, that we would say, outside the context of our 
societies, like our camps, right? So these Napi ones and I, you know, they were probably drunk every night and turning up their stereos loud and, you know, not very neighborly in the sense that they behave outside the normalcy of what we would call normal, right? And that's what we call not people. Okay? That's the culture of what we see. Okay? Are they still behaving that way? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You know, so to the not be ones in that, based on the thousands of years of normal, right? Those social fabrics that we adopted in that, you know, the social norms, the norms, right? We didn't have to be told, we didn't have a to have a police system in a sense that, you know, that's you're gonna go to jail for that, you know. We just knew our everyday living that we have to behave in a sense for the, you know, collectively for our group, right? Here's an example. The pandemic. All right, you know, there was just different people here. I need to go get a haircut. I need to go get my nails done, you know, and why, why am I? Gaina, our, our leadership told everybody, maintain your masks, maintain your distance and that. And we carried that a year after the mandates were over. Because collectively, we cared about the community as a whole and individual, right? And that's, you know, so those mandates, we still have that leadership in our heads and that, right? Strong, we listen to our elders, our leaders, and you know, let's move forward as a group, right? Not individual. So they're not people. That was the first people that came in. Okay, next page. Who are men? This is what we call right there. A woman is an apiat. Let's go into the uh, a man from. If I am a man from Ghana, I am a Ghana one. A Ghana one. Now, who is a Ghana one? Joey, Ghana one. Anybody else? Raise your hand way back there. Yeah. Gain one, yeah. So that's how we identify ourselves. And it was a group of men. We're all from you know the the black people. Oh my, gain one, come on. And the next one is a bikini one, a man from bikini. Okay, that's what we call these people. Gain one, bikini. Now of course, bikini is your prefix, right? So he comes from the Skadiro people and that, right? The culture of the Skadiros and that. Or the people that have uh, ripped up jeans from um, Levi, say, hi, ah, real picani. Six one, right? You already know that, you know, these words, the first part of the word, the prefix word is the culture of the people. The guan is the man. Six one, ten one, that's me, ten one, picani one. And of course, the long one, I'm ska. The word right here, the beginning is already in there. We just put south, I'm um, ska, I'm um, ska books. That's what we call south, right? Blackfoot is that. It's very compound. Words are compound in that, right? So, Gaina Kuan, Gaina, the first part of it, it's the culture, the mini chief main, right? Those Gaina Kuan's, boy, I tell you, they can never, you know, they're always arguing, right? They can never, just, there's, just, there's too many chiefs. And those bikinis and that, they just come around with their ripped up clothes and so forth. And those six guys, they come around with their black boxes. So those are the men, okay? That's how you describe who we are in that, right? There's an Indian man over there, but me, I look at him, not if he's bikinis, six guys are gay now, okay? That's how we view ourselves in that. Now, oh. so when we start to visit, one time, Years ago, I rode a plane to, where did I ride a plane to? But anyways, I rode a plane. <laughs> but hey, Nina, there was a man standing there and that. He was really, you know, like when we see our, like another Indian person, a native person and that, we take notice, right? And we kept staring at each other and that. Oh, this guy looks familiar and that. Amongst the planes, Indians were tall and real lanky and that. Well, this person was kind of, he was kind of taller. Actually, he was taller than me. And uh, 
I said, huh? We go say hi. And I said, hello. And I said, ah, hello. And he started introducing small talk. And he said, oh, you got the, where are you from? Okay, now. Oh, I'm okay. Hey, Quante. It was, uh, oh, what was his name? The guy from Ocaps. And I, I just met him too. Ernest Black Rabbit. And no, and I, just, I don't know where he was flying to. So, oh, you're just like, okay, Nico. You know, so, you know, we just, we were from the same culture and the same community. And he just started talking black. Oh, I said, I get the book, by oh, you know, just like, he sat down, had coffee, and he ate, and away he went. I don't know where he went. <laughs> but yeah, we take notice of each other in that, right? He said, oh, my God, I wonder where he's from. And that. Oh, because you be one. Yeah. So, Go to the next page. Aki, a female, right? As you can see, the prefix of the word of the person is right there. Kenaki, okay? The word aki is all through there. Can you see that? A-K-I. That's aki. Kenaki. Who's a kenaki here? Boy, Oh, everybody's hand, yeah, can So we know visually that this person comes from our community, but in our communities and that we're separated into other communities, right? Sub communities. Yeah. Moses Lake. Yeah, okay, you send it up. So. <laughs> Manetapug Moses Lee. Ah, he's there. Indian humor. So, so like the word of the people is your prefix and then aki. Okay? Shiksakaki. Just like Napi Aki, right? Napi, then they put the aki, you have a white woman, okay? The culture of Napi, you know, the bad culture, right? I'm scapi pi kanaki. Can you see that? I'm scapi pi kane, the southern, and then aki is at the end. I'm scapi pi kane. So, just in a short while, you've had 12 vocabulary words. Imagine that. What? With all vocabulary, right? So, kane, kane, kone. Kene, kenaki, right? Napi kon, napi aki, right? That's the 16 words. Wow. All within just a short while, right? Aren't I a good teacher? Yeah. yeah, next one. So aki is a woman. Nina is a man, but the guan indicates the man, okay? Okay, if you're a child, child is. The suffix right there, buka, okay? Buka is the child. So your prefix is going to be those same words that we had. Kene buka. Who's a kene buka here? Where's my kid? Oh, Joey. <laughs> that is Joey is a kene buka. In heart. <laughs> yeah. So a kene buka, whether it's a little girl or a little boy, it's a puka, right? There's an organization over here, just on the north side, on Stafford, called Upukase. Upukase, which means children, just like children. All children, Upukase, they're all children. And then, of course, Bikani Puka, a child that's from the Bikani area, right? A group of kids are playing in that, and oh, okay, it's a bikini puka, and he's got those scabs on his shirt. Yeah, I'm scabby bikini puka. Yeah, we all identify ourselves like that too. Boy, I I, I, I got to work with Kana Children's Services as a resource person. I went all the way up to Edmonton. We have children up there that are in care. And I taught Blackfoot to, you know, to the children and to the parents and that. They couldn't get over that the South Saskatchewan River, you cross that, you're in Blackfoot territory. 
Yeah, I was home. You know, it took me just two minutes. I was at the mall, went across the river, and I was home. Hey, I'm home. <laughs> but yeah, you know, and I was asking, okay, I'm see who gets and that. And then, you know, my parents, you know, well, these are from uh, Galicia. Oh, six k, six k Bukaya, right? And there's another group there from the Brockett area. So you know, these these children are here from Brockett. And in my head, I didn't say, oh, Bra I said, oh, Pikani Bukaya, from Pikani, right? And then um, another group from Sitsika. We're yeah, a, a, a collective group of kids are in care up there. Sikai Puka, Pigani Puka, and Akane Puka, isn't that right? I didn't ask their names. Skate in my I didn't I didn't really want to know their names. That. But I talked about yeah? some of our animals. Yeah. Okay, next one. Where are we? Gender. Wait, hold on. <laughs> man, when you say man, you say nina. Everybody, nina. point to yourself if you're a man. Nina, right? Nina also means chief. It means chief or leader, right? Not only a man, but that's the word we use for a chief. What's the mayor's name here? Uh, Spearman? Huh? Hygen. Hagen, Hagen, by the way, Mr. Hygiene, whatever you, he would be the Nina of Lethbridge, okay? Who's the mayor of Calgary? Yeah, I know he's an Aki, okay? Aki is a woman. The mayor is an Aki there. So then you would say Ninawaki. And Ninawa, is you put the Nina and Aki together, then you created a woman leader. Ninawa, chief woman. Okay? Is everybody else that have female leadership? In fact, we signed a treaty with then Queen Victoria, right? Is it Victoria? She was a Ninawa. That's where the word came. The queen, for the longest time, was Queen Elizabeth, right? You look to be what? 300 years old. He was the Ninawaki for years and years of that, right? Until, of course, it's not too long ago, took up, you know, he passed. Then. Hey, yeah. 96, eh? Oh, Pitaki. So, Aki, it, it's our woman. You remember all those words? That, anytime you have a name, those of you who have black names, I bet you have the word Aki in there. Huh? Anybody have Blackfoot names, Akiks? What's your Blackfoot name? Pita Aki, Eagle Woman. We have the same name as Olivia Gladstone. Yeah. Anybody else with a Blackfoot name? Akis. Akis. What's that? Oh, Akistaki. Akistaki. Ah, brave. To street, Simon. That's a non gender name. It's a non-gender name. It's kind of a verb meaning that it's almost like a war name for a woman. To street, Simon means that he took something that didn't belong to her. A coup, yeah? My grandmother and I used to come outside. Yeah. <laughs> she stole something back. <laughs> but that are key, right? If you have Blackfoot names amongst the women and that, it's either going to be a good name, right? Something that's non-gender, that's an action, or bitaxi, uh, what's your name again? A kisuaki. Yeah, brave. Kimata piyaki. Kimata. How would you translate that to a Kimata? It's not, it's not like you're... Because if you're, if you're Western, give me that, yeah. Uh, kind, kind woman. Yeah, there. Very kind. You got five bucks to let me? <laughs> so, our key is our women. Now, understand the Ninda is also your, your, your leader, your CEO, your COO. Or your, you know, your your 
the, the head of the commission. Those are your ninas. Anybody, anyone that has a leadership role within your organization is your nina. Yeah? If it's a woman, then what, what is it? Nina Waki. Yeah? Just like Mayor Koinda. Nina. Yeah. In the queen. Yeah. Nina. Yeah. Nina. Yeah. A woman leader. Nina. And there's lots and lots, right? The first Blackfoot Confederacy chief that was a woman, Marukaps, a girl strikes with the guns. Yeah, he was one of the first Ninakis in Blackfoot, in the history, in the history of all the leaderships amongst the Blackfoot. Gail strikes with the gun was the first one. And after that, Audrey, yellow old woman, right? Darlene, Darlene, yeah. That's close. Yellow old woman, yeah, Darlene. So we've had two Ninakis, eh? Women chiefs and that. So it's... Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, you know, our, our grandmother, Kumaki, and that boy, everybody, when she says something and that, we just all sit and we would listen and right until the end. Yeah. Yeah, plaited and plaited hair. Yeah, we come from the plaited hair, plaited. I can't understand anymore. So, old man, anybody here an old man like me? Oh, my goodness. Oh, Joey. Ah, I need to come over here. I'm going to go over here. So, the word Nina is in there too. Oh, means like he's very old in a sense that he's had many years. Mike. One of our uncles, Hans, that got the ball platter here. I said, No, but this is not a book. I get that student. I don't book. I get like a call. I want the mom. So, in a sense, that you know, they decide for themselves whether they're old or not. So, you know, because oh, I mean, somebody who has many, many calls, many, many, many years. Probably back in the days, our, our men were very, you know, the diets that we had. Straight water from the glaciers right here in the Belly River. Nothing else. We drank nothing but the water that was clear, blue, no algae, right? There's nothing in the waters, no beaver fever. We just drink the water right straight from the river. I remember that too. I used to do that not so long ago, back in the 70s, the Sundance. Yeah. But yeah, so you know, there was Umakinai, they lived really long back in the days of that. Yes, yeah. I was listening to a story of the last Indian battle right here, right? You know, it's in a group meeting for Peter. They were just so eager to join in on that. They, they didn't feel old, right? They were just right in there. Some of those 60, 70 year olds that are right in there, clubbing away. <laughs> <laughs> He was in his, in his 70s. It's an eats. Yeah. Um, uh, they, they, they train they train that black force to um, just like charge towards uh, the, the enemy. Yeah. Runs over. And runs over. Yeah. 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 Remember that. I like to hear that story. But yeah. Somebody who's old has many, many, many years in that, but they won't admit to that. I'm not going to admit to that. I ran a moonlight like run, and I'm 64. I didn't run because, oh, you just, you guys remember the storm we had? My goodness, the pudding was so, I could have skied down that hill. Literally, it was just so bad in that. My best time, I took third three years ago. Uh, in my age category, I took third. I got a medal. I should have brought it short off you guys. But I'm a runner, yeah. Yeah, but I'm not a Umakina yet. <laughs> but today, like, in today's, you know, in, in Western thought, and that, there seems to be a, an age, there's a me, like, there's something like you're, you turn 65, you're old, right? You start getting a pension and so forth, you know. But in our culture, and that, they won't admit, you know, I can still do the things that they do, ride a horse, I can go. 
Oh, you're still riding a horse. My dad was way back in the early 80s and that he would ride his horse and away he goes. Comes back, unsaddled, and then he got to the point, I think this is when he thought, he drove himself to the old age home. Yeah, I went to the point, he figured, okay, I'm going to retire now, no more horses. And the next day he sold all his horses. And, and he was quite old. When he, you know, he was in his 80s by the time he decided, oh, no more horseback riding for me. He was like, okay, that's it. And I think the only reason why I didn't ride was because he couldn't get up on the saddle. Oh, no, yeah, that's, yeah. He even left up his foot. Yeah. Yeah. Old cowboy. So. Joe. He was really old. He was uh, Joe, Peter, and explored all those cowboys. Oh, my goodness. Oh. I heard them, those stories that they used to tell. My dad owned Itoyo for years and that. And every, I'd say about 10 o'clock to maybe till about one, those old guys, Joe, Bruce Head, and all, all they do is come and they've had coffee. And all they do is just talk. They just tell stories. And if I get to sit in there one time, I, all I did was I just sat back and I just listened to their stories. Oh my goodness, it's just like reading a, a novel, right? It's just like, and, and the stories are pictorial in the sense they're very descriptive. You can see what they're talking about, that, right? Oh, and I heard some of those stories in that. And that's humor. You have to kind of look at it, see, you know, then they would say it and that they would laugh. And the women are, <laughs> if, you, if you see a group of women over there in the you know, all of a sudden they go, <laughs> oh, what are those ladies talking about? Kipitaki. Kipitaki. Remember the K and the B and the T's are all different characteristics, right? G, B, Da, G. Okay? Now, it's an old woman, but it's also a word that dates back to the days of the buffalo. Okay? You only become a Kipitaki if you can't perform the tasks that are necessary for that person to make moccasins, garments, or teepees. You just can't do them anymore, right? My hands are my vision, right? So then it has become not an old woman, but a kipitaki, because he can't perform those tasks anymore, right? My grandmother, Kumaki, was in his 80s, and he had an old uh, washer at a tub, and on the side of it, it had this, you know, this, uh, you know, what do you call it, a rinser, right? You got to put those clothes through the rinser and that, and then the other side. And he would carry that basket, and he would hang them up on the outside and that. Ah, he would say, I'm not an old lady yet. I can still do those tasks, ask of me. Oh, you see, right? And he still pounded. He made pemmican every summer. But the stone and a rock and that, boy, I tell you, he was an 80-year-old making pemmican and that. And he wasn't a kipitaki yet. He still performed those things and that. So that's what that is. A, oh, a woman that cannot perform those tasks anymore. Going back to the buffalo, right? And it was a very tedious, very knowledgeable. So this person he would turn around and it would be your encyclopedia. It would be your resource person in that, right? If a young group of women were given a buffalo, hey, we need a teepee. Ah, oh, we need to go get the kipitaki. She's going to be right there and she's going to show you how it's done. Because we didn't have knives, right? We didn't have the instruments and that. So these, you know, they knew exactly what kind of rocks to use to chip the knife, right? where to cut the, the, the buffaloes and so forth and that, you know, there's their knowledge over the years and that of doing those tasks are now very valuable. Huh? I want to speak to you. Yeah. Did you hear her, everybody? Just uh, you just heard not was once it is the opening the uh, job down to the groin was done. Uh, she just used her knuckles to peel the skin off of the field. I watched that lady do that. 
Yeah. 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 But she said, uh, I'm going to pay for this for a few days. And then I have to buy my Yeah, so you know, these kipitakis and that, when you think about the Western doctor, they're old ladies, right? You know, but in very valuable in our cultures back then, they still are. Blanche, boy, I tell you, you know, the stories that they told, you know, the things that they, you know, how they did those tasks without the instruments that we have today, right? So the Kapitaki, you give her a buffalo, boy, she would just instruct the, you know, the young ones, you know, this is how you're going to butcher it, this is how you're going to cut it, and this is how you're going to take the skin off of it, if you're going to use it, you know, just to hide, or, and then you have to, um, you have to plan it, right? You don't just take it to the harbor, right? Just tan it, and then you gotta beat it yourself, right? So you gotta tan it and so forth and that, right? So those skills, imagine, you know, that you know, the years that the Skipitakis watched her grandmothers do that past. And over the years and that, her observations, and again, very important that we listen and we watch, right? The environment was our classroom. In order for us to sustain ourselves as a group of people, we had to have a very dynamic group of individuals, men, our women, our children, right? We need our children and have to get order for our group of people to go beyond. We need these you know, our children to watch. It's to, you know, watch them. These are the skills that you need, right? Those are the days of old and that, right? You know, and then we listen to those. That's how we were able to say, well, you know, our leaders are re always leading us in, in, in the right direction, right? We made sure we had lots to eat, the best buffalo hides, and, you know, in my clothing. Look at this, right? And the best pants. Not like the big guy, they're all ripped up. But... So those are our genders. Now, each of them has. Of course, culturally, and that, you know, of course, you know, the Yumukina, you know, he's, he's a man that has had many years as a man, right? But he also, too, we look to these Yumukinas and how they conduct themselves in a group, right? Very, you know, they, they, they're like in essence, and I thought, you know, those people, and that, right? You can really turn to them. You're not going to be afraid to ask questions. The Yomachina and Kipitaki, they're more than willing to share that knowledge, right? Well, today, you're just Google, and you know, it's all on your Google, and if you want to find something else. So, right? just... <laughs> so, it was very oral. Everything that we did was very oral, and that and these individuals played a major role in the fabric, the social fabric of those communities, right? You know, and it's, you know, in contrast to you know what we've adapted to today and that right it's if you go back to that that lifestyle and that boy that must have been very not beginning up the right you know and I think oh when I see dances with wolves and that and how they conducted themselves in that camp everybody spoke right everybody had a chance to talk even the the, the loud individual and I hear that chance but he was he was heard. And that's how it was within, the, I think, the social fabric of that. But the women weren't excluded, you know. They were very much part of the process of those camps. Okay, where are we? You would say that the woman would be that little... Um, um, yeah, there. Right. <laughs> uh, so you can make the word Yeah, right here, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 No, right here, you know, that little devil? And then right here, well, the, the woman would be over here and then uh, you've got to listen to it. Not be able to be on the side. <laughs> Where are we? What time? Anybody need a break? Let's have a quick break. I've been talking here for like seven to two. Seven to, okay, let's have a quick five, ten minute break. If you need to go use the bathroom, go to refreshment, and we'll come back here and I'll, I'll share some more. Interpretation, right? I don't know what, where payday came from in that, but that's thing that came from the Americans and 
influenced our, our, our Canadians. So we are the people of a culture, okay? Okay, real quick, we have some more genders that we, when you have a new baby born, they'll say, oh, what did you get? What was it? They'll say, oh, it was a boy. No, it's not. Sakkuma. Sakkuma. You see that H? Now, that last class, and they, they really needed to stress that the H is one of the most difficult sounds of the Blackfoot because it comes from the throat. Okay? When you combine A H, right? The A is not an A, ah, it's an A, uh, like a cut, okay? the U sound. So it's Sach Kumapi, not Sach Kumapi, but Sach Kumapi. Yeah, Sach Kumapi. What did you have? Oh, I got a Sach Kumapi. Oh, a boy. Yeah? The Sach Kumapi is a boy, right? Uh, you know, we had a I had an elder, one of my mentors for many, 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 many years. And I, my knowledge in the, you know, in the song, the ceremonial song was a man named Sakumapi. And his English name was Andrew, and his last name was Weasel Fat. Oh, my goodness. That was his proper name, Sakumapi. So that's Sakumapi. Any boy in here, any Sakumapi? Oh, there's a Sakumapi. A girl is a kikwa. A kikwa. A gi. Right? A kikwa. Not a kikwa, but a, a kikwa. The a is always going to be like an a sound, right? Think of it as a u sound, like a c u t a, right? There's never going to be an a, an a, right? An a. It'll be an a pull. Okay? Baby is a s. s. Is sitzima. Is sitzima. Everybody go like this. Is sitzima. Is sitzima. Is sitzima. Is sitzima. Is sitzima. Oh, yeah. What do you call that in the Opam Kyo. That's something our, our women did with our sitzima is that they would sing to them. Not really how I say it, but you know, okay? All okay? meaning that they sing to the the little ones in their lullabies. Yeah, like a lullabies in that. Okay. I sit to my is it way, is it to my is it to my so you know what did you get into a new style? I did. I sang to him, yeah. I really had you know, I, I have two families. I have an older family that are in their 40s and 30s. My oldest daughter is 42. This, this, uh, what month are we? March. April. <laughs> I forgot my oldest daughter's birthday. My second oldest is 37, and my youngest in my first family is 35. Started up a new family, and they were sitting over here, and my son is nine years old. Plays hockey like crazy. <clears throat> and I had a new baby during the pandemic, and she's two. This sits him on. And then I, that's what I had to do. I had to start singing, but not in a sense the, the old fashioned black to play. I sang him the old, my bonnie lies over the ocean. My bonnie lies over the sea. My bonnie lies over the ocean. Oh, bring my, my Bonnie to me. I did. I, I, I got to really start singing those songs and that. But he's a good singer now, too, eh? Yeah, it's just a, it's, it's humming, yeah? And you just hold them right there. And my grandmother did that lots too. And I probably grew up in that. What is Sitsimon translates to? Of course, it's a baby infant in that. Do you remember the cradle boards? Okay. It's when they're wrapped in those cradle boards. When they, that's what they call it, Sitsimon. Yeah. They're wrapped. It's a baby, right? English. 
you know, you westernize the, you know, the translation, but in black, what they sit to mind is that little cradle person that's wrapped in those, those cradles. That's an Isitsuma. And then when he breaks out of that, then it becomes a puka, no longer Isitsuma, it becomes a child, right? And, uh, you know, they, in the old days, I think I, I only seen that maybe a couple times in our, in our Akukatsin, those Isitsuma, we don't do that anymore, right? Wrap them up, Isitsuma. That's what that means, Isitsuma, you wrap them up. And then when they start to walk in toddlers and they're a puka, they're children up until they're what, teenagers and they're sakina and they're <laughs> okay so those are all our genders now we're going to move into now before we done i'm going to do something really fun here okay you know the word oki okay it's all around us i see it at the university i see it over at the um I think it's over here too, not too here, right? Yeah. Oh, he was a collaborative. They asked me, I think I'm sure they asked um, Blanche when I was teaching here. They said, what's, what's a really nice welcoming word for people to come in into Lethbridge, a Blackwood word? Oh, he. Very simple. How does that come about? Okay, now let's go back to the days of the buffalo, the days of the TP, okay? If a person comes to your TP or lodge, Here's the door, right? You'll go, <clears throat> you'll clear your throat and make a presence that you're at the door of that person. And then the person inside the teepee will say, Hoki. That indicates you're allowed to go in, right? Means, you know, come in, welcome in that. Come out, okay, to you. Uh, I think it's a big, you know, and then they'll start conversing. But the moment that person says, Hoki, it's welcome. Come in, type of thing, and that. But it's also, oh, okay, hello. You know, it's like the Hawaiians, aloha means goodbye and hello, you know. But that's, it's like, well, okay. It's an old Blackwood word from the days of the teepee, right? And nowadays, and that, ding dong, ah, it's that uh, Avon ladies here again. <clears throat> So, you know, that's Oki, okay? All right. When you say, my name is, okay, Oki, you say, there's two ways of saying it, and I'm not going to say the first one. I'm going to say it my way. Everybody point your knee. The first part is knee, okay? Now, you know how to say the word since? Since. Yeah, since. Now, put a T before the S. Since. Me since okay. When I look up, I can see the scar. Scar. S K A. Me since scar and sim. Four syllables. Point to yourself. Me since scar sim. Me since scar sim. Again. Me since scar sim. Again. Need Saint Scar Sim. Now sing it. You do the tune of the farmer in the dell. It's Saint Scar Sim. It's Saint Scar Sim. It's Saint Scar Sim. It's Saint Scar Sim. Now you're going to say your name after you say that. All right. All at the same time. We all have different names. Okay. If you have a nickname, say that too. Okay, everybody. It's Saint Scar Sim. Julius. Yeah, okay. That's one way of saying my name is. Another one is what? Oh, yeah, you still have goats. You know, you slow walk and hunt. Walk slow. Ah, That's going to be my name. That's the kind. <laughs> so, anytime you have a knee as part of your speech, or not, it's the first person. 
Nee, Zünd, Scott, Sim, okay? Nee, okay? If the speech becomes with a K, ga, it's a second person speech, right? Nee, Zünd, Scott, Sim, die Zünd, Scott, Sim, okay? Anytime you have those. Oh, hey, hey, let's do a family. And here's another one too. If U is the beginning of that word we're, we're describing, it's a third person. And then he invites the third person over there. Yeah, that's how that works. Third, second, and third person perspective in our language, right? There's also animate and inanimate way of describing things, right? If I say there is a chair, milk, right? If there's a person, milk. Yeah, you know, it's it's, uh, it's very descriptive in the sense that it's animate and inanimate, okay? All right, so behind me, our family structures, okay? My dad is, it almost has the word nina on there, right? Now, you say it like this, nin. Don't say the A at the end, nin, okay? Now, I want you to say, u sim. Remember, the sim is me, me, okay? U is the third person. You're going to, I'm the second person. So, nin, u sim, ito pizzopi, or I'll say it in English. Nin, u sim, was. Okay? Ni, sim is me. Ni, u is third person. Okay. Everybody say nin. Yeah. Now name your day. Yeah. Nin Say it again. Now say the name. Yeah. And then the next one is ni ksis. Ni. Everybody point to your knee. Ksis. Ksis. This is where the K does not have that duck sound. If there's a consonant, it's a X, not a K, but a X. Okay? X. Nixus. Don't say the A at the end. Nixus. Nixus. Point to yourself. Nixus. Then you think of your mom. Utsinska sim. Nixus. Utsinska sim. Yukske Putaki. Oh, I haven't heard her name in such a long time. Oh, hey. Yeah, I, my mom, oh, way back in 1970, was killed by a drunk driver. Yeah. So that's why I said, oh, I haven't heard my, said her name. Yukske Putaki. That means either a three white woman or a Mutte Putaki. You know, like he's, he was punching somebody three times. <laughs> Two meanings in that. But yeah, anyways, Nixus. Everybody, Nixus. Utsinska Sim. Utsinska Sim. Utsin. I make that U in her. Utsinska Sim. Utsinska Sim. And I'll say your, your mother's name. Good. <laughs> well, you guys are black, but now oh, yeah, you guys don't need me. Yes, yes, um, yeah. Oh, wow. See those names and that, huh? You don't hear them and that. There's just not enough people that speak the language in that, right? Nin. Nin. Nixus. Nin. Nixus. Everybody point yourself. Nin. What's in Scotland? Wallace. Yeah. Nixus. What's in Scotland? You Scott Pataki or Eleanor. Yeah. This is where it gets really the there's no uh, uh, her or she in our black language. There's no um, genders it indicates her, he, his, and that. It's all kind of like you have to name that person and that, right? So that's why we only have one word for younger siblings. It covers both male and female. This gun, which is this one right here, it's a male thing. Only the main say this gun. 
And yeah, and it's 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 for your younger sibling, men, either male or female. Okay, it's a it's a little brother or a little sister. Okay, it covers both. So men say niskan, niskan. Yeah, yeah. And then think of a younger sibling. It could be a female or a male. Niskan. Okay. And I got lots of niskan. Lots of them. Niskan. And then, guys, we don't say this. This is for females. Females, you'll say, nieces. Yeah, nieces. Only the females say that. And only men will say the skin, right? If you're going to um, capture or you, you want somebody's attention, right? Then there's a female, right? Men, you'll say the skin. Or if it's a young man, the skin. Calling out to that person and that, right? You don't know that person, but it's a very inappropriate word to use. You don't know whether that person is not your family and that, but it's something that say, hey, man, it's scum, right? But if you were, you know, like myself and that, and there's a young lady, you'll say, kukuna, okay? Like this. This is part of your family, like this. Gu, gu, na. When you're calling out to your daughter, okay, men and women say kukuna. Yeah, kukuna. Yeah. Rather than calling, if you don't know that person's name, oh, I'll just say her name in that. Or if you're at a concert and somebody's yelling about, hey, kukuna, sit still. <laughs> you know, kukuna. If it's a young boy, you'll say this word. Tiki. Remember that wild stuff? Chicky. Now, it's like saying son, and the other one is Kukana, daughter, you know. And we all can say that. I know that, that individual may not be your daughter, but it's a very inappropriate word, term to use as an adult to any female that's young. Because what you've done is that you've created a bond. That person will know, oh, you know what? There's, there's that respect for that child already, right? Rather than saying, oh, young lady, kukana, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's a word to say daughter, right? And chiki, chiki, you know, son. Very appropriate, right? And it's very inclusive, right? Now you've included that person as part of you now. Right? Is that person going to listen to you? Yeah. If you refer to it as chiki and kukana, right? Kukana. You want to add anything? Bunch? You want to add anything to that? I've got an A for that one. <laughs> so those are our families, okay? Our immediate families in that, right? Nin, Nixus, and of course, Niskan, right? Both male and female, Niskan, and the ladies in this set. Okay, but that's the only difference in when we're when we're describing our families. Next. Yeah, we're gonna get them up here. Here we go. He had an older brother. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention this. Ah, my goodness. The word nixist, your mother, is the same word we use for your auntie. The same word. Right? So if you have an auntie, paternal, maternal is nixus. Okay? Of course, my time over already. Right? <laughs> my computer died. Oh! <laughs> yeah. I don't have my charger. Oh, uh, no. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have me on there. Hey! A little story here. When I started teaching kindergarten way back in 96, 97, the school year, um, Mr. Delaney, I'm old school. They call me Mr. Delaney. I'm not the uh, first name. Everybody called me Mr. Delaney and they still call me Mr. Delaney. A little girl was tugging at my jacket. Okay? She was going to ask you something. Uh, Mr. Dress Up. And I became Mr. Dress Up that school year. Then I have to kind of match Mr. Dress Up too, right? Eh? I have to find myself a tickle, 
trunk. <laughs> then I had to find some puppets, not case and fitting in, but you know, and I, I, I did use puppets and the entertainer. So I must address up for Mr. Delaney. So mother is your auntie's nexus for all of us, right? If you have an auntie that's your brother's, uh, I mean, your dad's sister or your mom's sister is your nexus, she's your mother, right? She's very, so the language in itself does not separate, oh, he's my maternal auntie, he's my paternal auntie from, you know, nexus, you know, it's, you, you have all these mothers in that, right? So there's no way you're going to get away with anything because you have all these mothers, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? So that's one of the things that keeps these children in check. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just, yeah. And even the word chicky or kukuna, right? Anybody within our community, somebody much older, if somebody much older refers to me as Niskan, you know, and I turn around, you know, there's no relationship in the sense we're not biologically related to that, but that Niskan, it would capture my attention. You know, I'm bonded with that person and that. I want to be part of this conversation with this person that, ah, Niskan, the moment you say that, oh, you know, all of a sudden I'm that, the little brother of this person that I've been on. It brings us together. The language brings us the bond of the language and that keeps us close to that, right? It's almost like verbally you're claiming. Yeah. Yeah, you claim that person in that, yeah. You've adopted that person, so to speak, in Western culture, but yeah. You know, in this kind of kukana, right? If you call out to a little girl, kukana, yeah, are you lost, right? You're calling out that daughter and that. And that, the language in itself, and that's a very caring, you know, you call out to that daughter, right? Oh, you know, I grew up in the 60s as a, as a child. And some of our elders, oh, I tell you, we couldn't play as much as we wanted to inside the camp. Ah, it's okay. So go outside to the camp and that. That's where you play. In the Sundance, not in the inner circle, and that we're all that's the you know, we get chased out in that. And everybody within our, our clientship that we camped on the north side, anybody <clears throat> would tell us, Chiki, you know, go play over there on that side, or Kukana, you know, go and we're always referred to as son or daughters by the older people, and that. And some of the uncles will say, Niskan, right. Or anybody for that, your neighbor. That's there's no exclusive in a sense. So he's my neighbor. That it's either a family, Niskan, Nisis, Nixis, or Aethis. I tell you, boy, if I was misbehaving back in those days, you know what they would do as a way to <clears throat> shock me to get back in, uh, you know, to conform? Water. Yeah. Totsuka. Yeah. Oh, That's all? What time is it? It's Oh, my smokes. I can keep going on and on. <laughs> no, so just, I'm going to end off here. You have all the papers. We'll go through it when I come back. And we're going to move on to probably when I come back. The whole objective of my teaching is for you to come to understand the view of the world that is now. Blackfoot's in that, right? And now for you to understand the language in that, the culture is in the language, right? Very descriptive. We see the world much differently. We're indigenous. So anything that came into this southern Alberta, it's all new. The system of governments, right? The communities, all new. We have to name them, right? You know what we call leftwards, right? Sigo. <laughs> black rock. Yeah, which means black rock, right? You know, the coal mines. So it's very descriptive in that. That's how Blackfoot works in that. We have to make sense of this new ideologies, the pedagogies that we are now growing up with, but we have to describe it in our language, what we see. 
based on a language that we speak to men, right? We don't borrow from another, you know, the Greeks or the, you know, to create Monday, Tuesdays. And we do have calendar moons. Right now, we're at Kapisaki, so which is which is the prog moon. Next full moon that comes is going to be the Apisakatu, see the flower blossom moon. Right? And then after that, Jir, long rain, misamsuta, okay? Nature, right? Do we have long rains in June? Yes, we do. The flood of 95, when did that happen? June. The flood in 2013, when did that happen? 2013. The flood of the century, 1962, 63. It was in June. Misamsuta, it's always accurate, right? The flower blossom moon next month. You're going to see a bunch of crocuses. Very descriptive, right here. It's nature based. It's what we see, and it's always true. And then, of course, September, I mean, July, we say, which means when the blueberries ripen. September, I mean, August, that's when the choke cherries ripen. Yeah. Oh, that's our candy month. Whenever I can, you eat that blueberries out there. Yeah, so it, it's a very land based indigenous language that the language is right from here. Our names are based on uh, the nature, the wind calling out, the birds and the animals, eagle, bear, many bears, many gray horses. Of course, horses were, well, we were one of the masters of the horse when it first came in. And of course, the horse is a non-indigenous animal. So we came into the black country, we had to give it a name. Bonacomita, elk dog. So there's not a horse that you need to know, but the whole world. Yeah, you know that. Yeah, the Spaniards. Yeah. Yeah, the Spaniards, when they brought the horse into this area, right? We have to call it a name. Exit. Oh, exit. And of course, our diets consist of foods that are non indigenous. And that. The cow is a non indigenous animal that's brought over, right? And we call that apuchskina, the white horns. So that's part of our diet. And that's, we have to change from a, a diet that consisted of bison, right? In the plant base that was right here in the berries to a cow, Albertskina, the white horns and that, right? Then this morning, and I'm trying to get away from there, but <laughs> another animal that's non indigenous that we have breakfast with in that, or the Nitawaki, the chicken, the hen, non indigenous. We give it a name, Nitawaki, which means only women. There's only females, because if you look at a flock of chickens, they all look like females. Where's the male? And that's what they see. Yeah, you need to walk. And in it, you know, then of course, the pig, non indigenous animal, we have to give it a name too. It's part of our diets. Aches in it, which means it eats just about anything. Aches in it. Yeah, it eats anything and everything, whatever you feed it. Can you say goodbye to the online people? Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, those who joined us online, thank you for joining us. In, well, Every next week is the golf, right? Blanche. And then the week after that, the Blackfoot Hub. And then after that, 18th, Mr. Dresser. Okay. <clears throat> right.